When I think of a long list of things that makes a great solid state amplifier sound great, powerful dynamic swings, deep bass with plenty of impact, texture and tone in mid bass and bass, expressive and open sounding mid range that sounds engaging, vocals that sound natural and untouched by any kind of coloration, clear and concise without being forward, top end extension that easily anchors the time domain, showcasing the sound of the detail in the recorded space of the song, pitch black backgrounds, an ultra silent backdrop behind the music, and last, an amplifier that makes you want to listen to the music and do nothing else. And with that, let's dive in and have a chat. Now, before we get to the overabundance of hyperbole, and trust me, there will be plenty of it, I need to confess something, and it's about these amplifiers that confused me right out of the gate. I plugged these into my Holo Audio Serene and my Maydac using balanced connections, fired them up, and presto, I was in business, and my goodness, folks, business was good. In fact, I was so impressed by how good everything sounded, I called up Danny and I said, hey man, you really need to hear something. Anxious and excited, we hooked up these mono blocks to Danny's system, which consists of a bunch of Dodd audio gear, off the grid, single-ended preamps, press play, and let me put it this way, my face fell off my face. <laughs> Man, I have never been so let down and confused as to why or what the heck was going on. To this day, that experience haunts me, and I wish I knew what the heck happened. The amplifiers sounded very thin, hyper detailed and the body base and low end extension that I was in love with was gone, poof. It just wasn't there. Now, knowing that I had these connected to all balanced gear, that could have been the issue or maybe it was a weird issue with input output impedance. I'm not sure, but I've tried these amps with all the gear that I have in house, both single ended, balanced, and I haven't been able to replicate what happened at least at my house, it's weird, it's bizarre, but all at the same time, it did happen, and I think that it's at least worth mentioning. Here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna reach out to Burson, and I'm gonna bring this up, and if they have any ideas, I'll update their feedback in the comment section down below. The Burson Timekeeper 3XGTs are high current class AB monoblock amplifiers that dish out class A goodness up to 30 watts. They are fully discrete with direct coupling circuitry and feature a fully differential input stage. Into four ohms, each monoblock can pump out 180 watts and 110 watts into eight ohms. Taking a look at the amplifier, the first thing that one might assume as I did was, uh, uh are you, are, are you kidding me? Like where, where is the rest of the amplifier? And even more when you see this. What? This, what appears to be a cheesy wall wart adapter, one might think as I did, these have got to be a joke of high end nonsense and probably won't sound all that great. But alas, Anyone who assumes these things, myself included, couldn't be more wrong about the timekeepers and getting this out of the way now. They are probably my favorite solid state amplifiers that I've spent time with, regardless of the price. So that's a really big deal, and I don't typically say things like that. And now that you are taking this a little bit more seriously, and no, Burson isn't paying me, and no, Burson didn't tell me that I get to keep these if I say nice things. And yes, every single word that I'm about to say is exactly how I feel, so yeah, let's go. If a solid state amplifier doesn't offer dynamic swings, it is better served as a paperweight. Whether it's when the orchestra gets big or the chorus of a rock song that hasn't been brick walled in post, we want to hear the difference of when the band is doing 30 miles per hour and the difference when they step on the gas and they are doing 90. 
Solid state, when done well, should be able to handle these swings without sounding contrived or pushed. They should also be able to rebound as things go from big to bigger to biggest. A lot of these traits that I just described are often the result of a great topology, yes, but even more a power supply that can keep up with the topology. When a solid state amplifier sounds claustrophobic or perhaps runs out of gas, it is often, not always, but often the power supply that's to blame. Essentially, being the chubby kid who can't quite scale the fence. With the timekeepers, it didn't matter what the dynamic swing was or how loud that I decided to listen. In every single session, it laughed, asked for more, so I pushed it, then it laughed some more, and this kept going when I realized that I was entering legit triple digit decibels and I still had what sounded like headroom in the amplifiers. Did I keep listening at that level? No, no, I wanna keep whatever hearing that I have left. The truth is I never hit and cannot seem to find the ceiling in these amplifiers. It's freaking absurd. The more that you turn them up, the more open and beautiful they sound. At no point do they collapse, at no point do they surrender, and at no point do they resemble anything close to a chubby kid trying to scale a wall. So, they come with these cheesy wall ward adapters, and you know what? I don't care. What I do care about is what this amp has proven, which is we as audiophiles need to start listening first with our ears and not our preconceived notions with our eyes. To say that I love tubes and what great tube amplifiers bring to the party is an understatement. With that being said, while great tube amps can dish out some serious bass, it has been my experience that great, really great solid state amplifiers can dig even deeper and they can do it with more authority and grip. Deep bass on the timekeepers is not only another trick up their sleeve, but they dish it out across the entire volume spectrum and even low volumes, which is rare and difficult to do. Back in the 70s, when you saw a loudness button on an amplifier, this was their exact purpose, that when pressed while listening at lower volume levels, you would be able to hear deeper bass and more resolution on top. With the timekeepers, listening at lower levels and especially moderate levels, I was really impressed with the level of deep and meaningful bass that I heard from these amplifiers. Sure, it got better as you creeped up the volume, but still, the difference between low and higher volumes was nowhere near as drastic as a lot of amplifiers that have come my way. Throwing everything that I could find, even organ and chamber pieces with the lowest of lows, the timekeepers simply do it and don't hold back. It's all there, waiting for you to discover, and when you have that access to the bottom barrel base, the challenge left is finding speakers that can keep up with the timekeepers. Ah yes, the sweet sound of whale farts. I've talked about this on my channel when walking through speakers, but at the same time, the same can hold true for some amplifiers. While nowhere near as extreme with speaker selection, it has been my experience that some amplifiers can hold back in the texture and tone department, especially with lower end content. Can I prove this with any kind of a measurement? No. Am I 100% certain that I wanna die on this hill? Probably not, but I can't and I won't ignore things I have heard enough to notice a pattern. Subjectively speaking, some amps just seem to offer more resolution in lower mid-range, mid-bass, and bass than others. With the timekeepers, this is one of those amps that when the string is plucked on the upright, sure, you do hear the sound of the attack of the string, but you also seem to get that window into the body of the bass. It's as if you can clearly identify that this upright sounds more complex or it has its own unique voice based on the wood being used, the bracing and the structure of the bass and so much more. Now, setting the tired example of the upright bass to the side, the same can be said for resolution waiting in tom-toms and kick drums. That when struck, you have an idea or starting point of 
why the toms on this song or album do indeed sound a little different than the next one. That the resonance that you hear, the pitch, and the punch being conveyed is unique, and the texture that you hear is both satisfying and leads to an addictive craving of hearing more and more and more music. I gotta be honest, I'm not a big fan of coming up with ridiculous audiophile words to describe how things sound. It's a lot harder than you think. With that being said, expressive and open seems to be how the timekeepers handle all things in the mid-band. Checking out tracks that I've used for nearly a decade on my channel, Old Pine from Ben Howard's Every Kingdom, always reveals just how wide an amp or speaker can spread its wings. It's one of those tracks that when the system is struggling in one way or another, can sound narrow or even compressed. On the right system, which is the experience that I had with the timekeepers, the song sounds like it's been set free. Every single strike on the acoustic and all the space in between the instruments and vocals all sound open. Not only that, if we define open as sounding wide, expressive might define the little nuggets of detail that we seem to find and hear in the depth of the stage. That some things sound a little bit more forward and some things sound a little bit further back. Now, the distance between those things give this depth to the stage and how dynamic that information or those nuggets sound within the stage is what leads me to say the timekeepers are absolutely expressive whether it's acoustic guitars or percussion or anything else for that matter, it all sounds free to dance within the soundstage, both expressive, wide, deep, and open. Being expressive and open throughout the mid-range doesn't always mean an amp is going to excel at providing natural sounding vocals. Sometimes there is a sacrifice a designer needs to make and what you end up with is some kind of a coloration that might affect the vocals. While not as common as with speakers, some amplifiers can sound darker or thinner in vocals, some amps can sound a little bit more chesty, and some can sound a little bit more nasally. More extreme examples might have you wondering why Mark Knopfler sounds like Barry White or why Madonna sounds like Dolly Parton. Keeping this short and to the point, this amp provides a straight line presentation of all vocal content and sounds absolutely natural. Nothing in vocals sounds colored or bumped in a specific bandwidth, and anything played back sounds lifelike, holographic, and convincingly real or natural. Of all the frequencies in the bandwidth, it's typically the upper mid-range where we see some problems in hi-fi. Get the upper mid-range wrong, and what you have is listening fatigue or nails on the chalkboard. Get it right, and what you have is a clear and concise presentation of electric guitars, cymbal hits, and top end of female vocals that rarely, if ever, leads to fatigue. The first time that I cranked ACDC with the timekeepers, I knew that I had something worth chatting about simply because each and every single cymbal was not only easy to discern, but it all sounded ballsy and realistic, and yet, no fatigue. Heck, even when cranking these amps, every single smash or crash sounded the way cymbals should sound, but here is the point. Nothing ever sounded forward or bright while still sounding realistic. Well past the point of fundamental hits, past the point of speakers being bright, past the point where we have true extension, where we grasp the things like the sound of air? <laughs> I feel like an idiot whenever I say that air has a sound, but it does. I think it does. It does. It does. And even more, the timekeepers know how to grab it, bottle it up, and then somehow sprinkle it into our listening rooms and spaces. Only when comparing the timekeepers to something like a really great tube amplifier that excels with that sense of air and holographic information in the time domain, would I say that the timekeepers even have a rival? Again, when an amp's topology is well engineered and the power supply has been treated with reverence, 
often the result is not just great sounding music, but equally important, the silence in between the notes, the background of the music, and the sweet sound of nothing added to the performance in terms of noise or junk can be the determining factor between good amplifiers and great amplifiers. The timekeepers are dead silent. I mean, no noise ever. When music isn't playing or is playing, you will hear nothing but the music. And I can promise you this, you will never hear anything that has you thinking that now what you need to do is rush out and buy a fancy pants new power cord. Having that pitch black background and silence in between the instruments is definitely something that timekeepers do. And what that means is everything that we have already mentioned so far has a beautiful spotlight on that particular attribute and that attribute only, meaning you get to hear the sound of the acoustic, not the acoustic plus noise, or the sound stage and how wide and holographic it is. It's without any additional junk added to it that with the timekeepers, it's you left alone in the dark. And from the darkness, you have the performance. And in that performance, it is left alone. So, I have had the luxury of being the kid in the candy shop for the last decade. When it comes to trying out and reviewing all of this hi-fi gear, some I can afford and some I can't. At the end of the day, the number one lesson that I have learned about all of this stuff is the fact that high-priced hi-fi doesn't always mean it's great. I have also learned that low-priced hi-fi isn't always a bargain and sometimes it's complete junk. The ultimate decision maker for me these days that establishes if something is truly great, worthy of all of this ridiculous over the top hyperbole, regardless of its price tag, is how it makes me feel when I'm listening. Sure, there is the analytical side of music or hearing something with my brain, which is what I find myself doing with almost everything that comes in the doors. However, there are times when something hits me in a different way. These products somehow achieve the impossible in that my brain just sort of turns off. That while listening, and that's the key word, truly listening, not just hearing what's happening, I find myself attached to what it's all about, which is the music. That, at no point, I'm no longer obsessing over half of the stuff that we just talked about, that there is indeed a time when all of these boxes are checked, that the result is a product that simply just reconnects me to the music and nothing else. And that, my friends, is the greatest compliment that I can give to Burson Audio. They didn't just make another amplifier that's worth checking out, they created an experience that could be enjoyed for the rest of my audiophile life. And with that, I'll see you burst in loving audiophiles in the next video.